one of the great privileges, blessings I have had is I have a mother who loves Jesus and loves me. And uh, it's, a, it's a great blessing to uh, have such a mom. And when I use the word love, I, I am defining it not just as some emotional attachment to her child, but really a biblical love. Which kids, what that translates to, when I was your age, I got what we called back then whoopings. Um, and I, believe it or not, was a little mischievous, so I got my fair share of whoopings. And it was usually with, uh, I mean, there were all kinds of assortment of tools. There were, you know, there were belts and switches and tree limbs and pa- whatever was close by, really. Um, and so that was kind of how it went down at my house. But that was never the worst part. The worst part was always the talk that went with the whooping. See, the whooping is temporary. I mean, it just stings for a little bit. But man, that talk, it went on and on and on at times it felt as a child. Uh, if, if there are kids in the room, you can just nod your head. You don't have to say amen. I know what you're talking about, right? So here's what happens. Kids, in that moment, your parents who are loving you are trying to teach you. They are trying to take the wisdom that they have learned through God's word, through life, whatever that may be, and they are trying to convey that wisdom to you. And they are doing the best they can to say it, to explain it, to illustrate it. And unless you're in the really rare like 1%, you didn't get like a PowerPoint with bullets, right? You didn't get that kind of an explanation. No, you got stories. It was all over the place. You say, what does this have to do with our study of Hebrews? I just want you to pause for just a moment and understand something. Those chapters and verses in your Bible were not put there until like 1,300 years after Jesus. It is important, it is critical for us to break down and study every word of God's word. To know the author's intent and the definition as he meant it to be. It's critical. But sometimes those of us who study God's word can spend years going word by word so much down into the trenches of that study that the main points, the overarching mm, communication, the principle of that letter We just don't ever zoom out enough to see it. And as we study God's word, I want to encourage you, the church, to do both of those things. To understand that these letters were written so that you would read them in one setting. They were written with concepts, with principles, with truths in mind as the apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is trying to convey to the church a truth that would change their life. We have to do both. And over the next few weeks, we're going to chase a concept. And this is going to happen throughout the book of Hebrews because our author is going to continue to make these arguments that go back into the Old Testament, that rely on information that they would have understood, that has given them a certain worldview. And the author of Hebrews is going to communicate who Jesus is in light of that worldview. And so we're going to look at the next few weeks and they're going to stack. And this is as much of a plea as I can give you. Be here consistently through the next few weeks. If you miss a Sunday, go back and listen to it. But don't lose the flow of what's going to happen over the next chapter and a half. It is so, so rich And for those of us who struggle sometimes with worry, sometimes with anxiety, sometimes with security, sometimes we, you know, we're a little passive and we lack boldness, sometimes our faith just isn't where we want it to be, this section of scripture can be a great encouragement to you. And so I want to challenge you, commit to being in the word over the next few weeks with us as a church. We're studying through Hebrews and We've just finished chapter 1 and 2 in the author's kind of opening point that Jesus is the better revelation. 
God in full has made himself known in the Son. The revelation proclaimed in Jesus surpassed that of God's heavenly messengers, the angels. For through Jesus, we know God. And now we move forward into a little bit of a shift in the argument. And for the next chapter and a half, the author's next point can be summarized in our kind of series title that Jesus is the better rest. And by chapter 4, he's going to make that really clear, and he's going to write to his, uh, his audience, and he's going to say, let us strive to enter God's rest, a rest that is paid for and delivered in Jesus. It, it really is the unpacking of the doctrine of reconciliation. In other words, that we were once lost and enemies of God. But we have been reconciled, made right before God. We are now in right standing. The author of Hebrews is proclaiming those in Christ have an absolute peace with God. No longer separated. No longer enemies. You rest in the presence of God. And so this rest that we're going to read about for the next few weeks, it's not describing some type of intermission. It isn't some brief respite. It's not a nap, okay? By the way, any guys nappers? You guys nappers? All right, here's here's the truth. Some of you like both hands. I like that, yeah. I I can't take, I hate naps. Like, like. It just, I feel worse after napping for like 30 minutes. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And then like if you, by the way, if you start snoring, is it a nap or are you just sleeping at that point? I don't know how this really works. Kids, any of your parents snore when they take naps? Any, yeah, 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 point them out. That's all right. That's okay. That's good. That's good. I like it. We're not talking about something that's brief. We're talking about more than that. I want to give you a term, and I want you to kind of understand and see rest through this term. Pastor Paul mentioned it already, deliverance. Consider an indebted servant who is working off the debt of 100 lifetimes. It is a debt that is greater than he can pay. The author is pointing out that Jesus has paid a debt we could not pay and has delivered a rest we could not obtain on our own. Which means any thought of rest apart from Jesus is fleeting. It's an illusion. It's not absolute. Rest outside of Jesus is just a brief nap. But what the author here is talking about is that Jesus brings a rest that is a reality-changing deliverance. Let me give you another parallel in your New Testament. Jesus talks about this same concept. And he plays it out just the same way in one of my favorite passages in Scripture. In John chapter 4, Jesus has a conversation with a Samaritan woman at a well. And he says this in verse 13. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. You drink out of the well, you're just going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The Samaritan woman hears this and sarcastically in just kind of a disbelief and a dismissive response says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. Or have to come here to draw water. It is an out of this world claim to never be thirsty again. Listen, it is an out of this world claim that you and I 
might have absolute rest. Peace with God. That we might be in right standing with him. And so only an out of this world deliverer can do such a thing. Only Jesus. And as a Christian, I am really quick at this moment to say amen. Salvation by Jesus and Jesus alone. I believe that. My faith is in that. I proclaim that. And man, I want to build my life around that. I long for the Spirit to grow me in that reality. And yet, you know what I find myself doing again and again? Instead of being satisfied in him, I keep going back to those same wells. Instead of finding my rest in him, I keep going back in search of those same naps, those fleeting things. And although I would never say it, my practices work to conform Jesus into just another well, just another nap. As if he is something I am just adding into all these other things in my life. There's compromise there. And in chapter 3 and 4, the author of Hebrews is going to proclaim that Jesus is the better rest. For he is the only rest. And to make this point, the author is going to draw attention back to Moses and Joshua and the rest, the deliverance that they delivered and contrast that with the rest that is in Christ Jesus. And this context is somewhat lost on us because when we think of Moses and Joshua, the truth is we don't know those guys super well. Some of us haven't really read that much or studied enough in our Old Testament to really even know the stories that are there. And even if we know about them, the truth is we don't care that much about them. I don't mean that as in we don't care to learn about them. I mean it like we don't have an emotional attachment to them. Kind of like when you watch the news and something horrible happens to somebody on the news, you kind of go, oh, that's sad. But if that thing happens to someone in your family or someone you know, you feel it much more. It's convictional. See, Moses and Joshua probably aren't your heroes. They're probably not people in your life that you think has established your nation, your laws, your cultures, your preference. You don't look at them with some sense of indebtedness. But to these readers, that's how they saw them. They were giants. They were heroes. God used them to bring deliverance and blessing into their life. They established their culture, their ways, their traditions, their festivals. They gave them an understanding of who God is, who he's called them to be. And so in Hebrews chapter one, or chapter 3, verse 1, the author writes, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle, and the high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Let's just pause here for a minute, see our big truth that Jesus is superior to Moses, that the rest, the deliverance that comes through Jesus is greater than that that comes through Moses. Now, when we say Jesus is superior to Moses, again, I kind of think we read it and go, well, duh, and just kind of move forward. But I'm going to ask you to think back to those principles and the concepts that the author is conveying here. And I want you to be able to kind of have a better understanding of what it means as we build into this point that Jesus is the better rest. That there is absolute rest in him 
And there is no ultimate rest to be found anywhere else. And to do that, we kind of need to have an understanding of who's Moses? Well, the short answer is he is a deliverer of Israel. He led a group of oppressed slaves to become a great nation. But I'm a teacher, and I've learned over time why just say something in a sentence when you can explain it for 15 minutes. So I want to take you back. In the beginning, God creates everything. Everything. He speaks it into existence. And he creates the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve. And in Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. In verse 28, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And in verse 31, God looked out on his creation and said, it is good. It is good. But kids, you know the story, right? Adam and Eve, they sinned. They disobeyed God. They chose their own will, their own pursuit over obedience. And in that moment, sin and all of its consequences enslaved us and with it became the toil that was associated with our work the pain and the suffering death Paul says in Romans 5 15 sin came into the world through one man and death through sin so death spread to all men because all sinned one trespass led to condemnation for all men, and through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. And in that moment, God in his love and his mercy prophesied a deliverer who would crush the head of the serpent and redeem is created men and women to himself. That he would redeem from man children to be adopted into the family of God. And you guys know the story. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden and they began to multiply and grow. And you guys remember some cool people in that season, guys like Seth and Enoch. Kids, you'll remember like Methuselah. He's the guy that lives to be like really, really, really old, right? But that time created generation after generation that only became more and more evil. And in Genesis 6, verse 5, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created. Except he found favor with a man named Noah. Remember the story, he tells Noah to build an ark. Noah does just that. Noah and all his family, they jump in the ark, right? All these animals come in two by two. The world floods, and God in his wrath kills every man, woman, and child. Every breathing thing on the earth, not in the ark, the Bible says, dies. Noah gets off of the ark, and he's told the same thing that Adam and Eve were originally told. Be fruitful, multiply. And so we all kind of come back to Noah and his family in that moment. And generation after generation, they kind of begin to do this. They begin to work together. And you remember the story, kids, of the Tower of Babel, right? They're all working together really for this evil purpose, for this self-centered purpose. And God, in that moment, in an incredible thing, just disperses them by giving them all different languages. And God's word says that it dispersed them from there all over the world. And as generations would go by, God finds favor with a man named Abram. He'll later change his name to Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, he makes a promise to Abram. He says, I will make you a great 
nation. And through you, all the people of the world will be blessed. Why? Because through Abram, the deliverer will come. And you know the story. I mean, this sounds great. Abram's already 75 years old when he's called. I mean, he's already an old dude. And he's thinking, all right, I need to probably have some kids. That's important. Except in all of that, it's delayed. And God is being very specific. He's promised Abraham a great nation. He takes him out, says, look at the stars. If you can count them, that's how many descendants you're going to have. He says, This land will be yours. He promises him a great nation, a great land, but he's not having any kids. And you remember in this, finally, even after his disobedience, in which he kind of arranges this adoption of Ishmael, God says, my promise is not going to go through Ishmael. In his old age, he has a son, Isaac. In Genesis 17, 21, God says, I will establish my covenant with Isaac. And then Isaac has two sons. Remember them, Jacob and Esau. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Jacob was a smooth-skinned man. Esau was a hairy man. I just think that's odd that that makes its way into Scripture. I don't know. Maybe the rest of you are just way more serious about it than me, but I think that's cool that it's there. And you remember Jacob and Esau. Esau sells his birthright, however, to Jacob. His part in this promise To bring a deliverer, he sells it for a bowl of stew. And so here we are now, we're back to Jacob. And finally, we'll begin to see the birth of the nation of Israel as we know it. Jacob will work for a man named Laban so that he can marry his two daughters. Rachel, who the Bible says is beautiful, And the one Jacob loved, and Leah, who the Bible describes as weak-eyed. Again, all kinds of great information you're getting this morning. Weak-eyed Leah. All right, anyway. He loved Rachel. And so he ends up with these two wives, and Leah begins to have children. She has Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah, four kids, and And Rachel's wanting to have kids, so she kind of arranges this adoption, we'll say, with her servant and has two kids. And then Leah says, well, if you can do that, I can do that. And Leah gets her servant involved, and they have two more kids. And then Leah ends up having some more kids. She has Issachar and Zebulun, has two more kids. And then finally, Rachel has a son, Joseph. And remember, Jacob loved Rachel. And so, man, he loves Joseph. Remember the coat of many colors, the brothers get mad, and they they do what? They they sell him. First they're going to kill him, but they end up selling him. Joseph goes to Egypt. He's a servant in Potiphar's house. And then the Lord brings him up, except things go bad. He ends up in jail because Potiphar's wife lied about him. Then in jail, he's interpreting dreams and The people he interprets dreams before the Pharaoh are restored, but they forget about him again. You know the story. Finally, Pharaoh has a dream, and no one can interpret the dream. And the guy who Joseph had rightly interpreted his dream goes, oh, wait, I remember a guy. They bring Joseph out of jail. He interprets the Pharaoh's dream, and it's not just any dream. It's a dream that makes Egypt the first superpower of the world. Because in a great famine, that would go on for years. Egypt was prepared, and they're able to store up all the food. And let's just be honest. If there's no food and you have all the food, you're rich. So Egypt gets set up as this superpower, and you remember the story, right? Joseph, there in Egypt, is made like second to Pharaoh. He's over everything. And his brothers come back in search of food. There's Joseph. He messes with them for a little bit, but for the sake of time, he ends up moving his father and all his brothers and this family, this promised nation, 
to the Goshen Valley in Egypt, where there they begin to multiply and to grow generation after generation. Except they grew so plentiful that there came a Pharaoh after that did not remember Joseph and looked out and goes, these guys aren't Egyptians and there's so many of them, they're going to take over. And they made them their slaves. An enslaved people, not really much of a great nation. The land they're promised, they're not there. And these people, with this promise that went all the way back to Abraham, begin to cry out to God and say, hey, we're not a great nation. We're not a great land. We're enslaved. We're oppressed. We're beaten. And God raises up Moses. A baby who was born in that setting and cast off down the river and was adopted, right, by the Pharaoh's daughter. Who fled Egypt because he murdered an Egyptian for beating a Hebrew slave. He's out. He's a wanted man. And God comes to him and says, hey, you are going to go back and lead my people to be what I promised them to be. And Moses does just that. He goes back to Egypt, and by the power of God, through miracle after miracle, a group of slaves marched out on the superpower of the world. You remember it. There were incredible displays of God's presence. There were the ten plagues. They walked across dry ground as the Red Sea parted and they fled. You remember the deliverance and the presence of God that was a cloud by day, fire by night, manna, bread, rain from heaven. They didn't starve in the wilderness. They were given the law By the way, a nation needs order. But more than that, the law revealed to them who God is and who they are. And for the first time, they had written word, a clear revelation. The tabernacle was constructed and built, and the presence of God was with his people. And the person who was out front leading this was Moses. Moses. And then you remember there's a rebellion. In spite of all this, the spies go in to check out Canaan, the land they were promised. And they said, we can't go there. They're really big and we're really small. The Bible uses the word and says, we'd be like grasshoppers. I, I, when I was a boy, uh, again, you just step on a grasshopper. You pick them up, you throw them, you know, it's mean, I don't do that now. But, you know, back then, you can. It's itty bitty. That's what they're saying would happen to them. They could just squash us. We don't stand a chance. When they came back and they gave the report, the people of Israel wept. And they even lied. They exaggerated and they said the land is a place of death. They made the land that God promised them seem like a bad land. And all of Israel's gathered and weeping and sad. And Joshua and Caleb stand up and say, no, 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 we went. And we can do this. You've seen all that God's done before you and he will continue to fight for us. If God says it's our land, it'll be our land. You know what the people of Israel did? They didn't go, oh yeah. You know what they did? They picked up rocks and said, let's stone them. And you know the only reason Joshua and Caleb don't get stoned in that moment? is because the presence of God sat down on the temple. It took a miraculous thing to take those leaders 
from being stoned by their own people. They, humble, they got together, the people of Israel in that wilderness. You know what they said? Let's make a new leader and let's go back to Egypt. Let's get rid of Moses, appoint a new leader, and let's go back to the well that we used to drink out of. They were scared. They didn't want to die. And God said, because of your lack of faith, because of your disobedience, because you put me to the test, you and your generation will not see this land. You won't rest in the land I promised you. You won't see this great nation possess this great land. You will not see the blessing. So for the next 40 years, they wandered around in the desert and died. And after Moses died and a new generation came about, Joshua leads them into the promised land, and through about seven years of war and battle, the land was theirs. And one of the more boring passages of Scripture for us to read, but is incredibly, incredibly powerful, is this section in the middle of Joshua where it goes through tribe after tribe and says, and you get this land, and you get this land. And you get this land. And the next time you're reading through Joshua and you're there in the middle of it and you're going through chapters and chapters of land allotment, don't miss the coolness of what's happening. God is fulfilling his promise through generations all the way back to Abraham. So all this is being captured by the author of Hebrews. All of it. Why? Because these oppressed slaves were delivered to rest as a great nation and as a great land. And as God used Joshua and Moses to deliver such a rest, it's still temporary. It's not absolute. As much of a deliverance as that was, as much of a rest as was felt in the security of the nation and the promised land obtained. Listen, the author of Hebrews is saying to these people, as much as they would feel it, as much as it was personal to them, Jesus delivers a better rest. Jesus is superior to Moses. So let me break it down in a few big ideas as you'll see here in the rest of the text quickly. First, Moses was a faithful servant in God's creation. Verse 3, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. So now the author switches to this picture of a house. God is the owner. He is the builder. He is working over the house. Moses is the servant. He is working in the house. Moses is a faithful servant in the house, not over the house, in the house. And so you got to ask yourself a quick question. What made Moses faithful in this account? What is the author of Hebrews talking about? Well, he makes it pretty clear, verse 5, faithful to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. Moses was a faithful servant of God Because he pointed to the Son of God. He pointed to Jesus. He pointed to a better revelation to come. Better than the deliverance of the law or the nation or the land. See, Moses wasn't over the house. Moses was a part of the house. And his part was to point to Jesus, the Son, the Deliverer to come. And in this, he is an example unto us who our part in the house of God is to make much of Jesus and point to him, the Deliverer who has came and will come again. And so we see that just 
beautiful depiction of Moses and his faithfulness. Next, we see Jesus is a faithful son over God's creation. Continue in verse 6. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Keep with this picture of a house. God is the owner, the builder. He's working over the house. Moses is the servant working in the house. Now Jesus has his divinity once again proclaimed as the son who is over the house. Jesus isn't a servant in the house. Jesus is God over the house. Therefore, Jesus delivers a rest beyond Moses' authority or his capability. Therefore, Jesus is worthy of more glory. Final big idea. Jesus is the confidence and the hope of his creation keep going in verse 6 and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope as you read this don't miss the forest for the trees the main thing is the plain thing okay the rest delivered by Jesus is final it's final Everything else is just a nap. It's water from the well. You'll be thirsty again. You hearing me? Real rest in your life is only found in Jesus. Everything else is going to leave you thirsty again. It's just a nap. Those who are in Jesus, however who are of his house, you rest assured. You rest assured. You hold to your faith with confidence, with a certain hope that produces a boldness in the way you live as one who has been delivered, as one who is in right standing before God, at peace with the supreme being, the creator and sustainer of all life. We, who are in Christ Jesus, live at rest with the bold confidence through whatever circumstance may come into our life. Why? Because Jesus has delivered a better rest. They know Israel's history. They know they're going to lose that land. They know they're going to be wrecked as a nation. But our rest is anchored in Jesus. Let let me give you one more parallel as we prepare to close. The high school and the family discipleship plan is studying through the book of Acts right now. And this past week they were in Acts chapter 4 in one of my favorite passages in Scripture. And by the way, if you're here, you're a high schooler, you're not in the Word, lean into the family discipleship plan. It's a place to start. Parents, if you're not talking to your kids about God's big truths, lean in. It's a great resource and a way to help you. But this past week, we're in Acts chapter 4, and it's this great account in which Peter and John are arrested by the same group of people that killed Jesus not too long ago. And they're going to be threatened to stop preaching, stop teaching in the name of Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge. Verse 20, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Now this is Peter, by the way, who not too long ago is denying Jesus. And now he's saying, I can't help it. Kill me if you're going to. But what I have seen and what I have heard has changed me. I see the world different. That's the picture of the boldness that we're talking about. That's the picture of the faith that has the confidence to stand. And it changes everything. You see that this saving faith produces this boldness, whether that's Moses or Caleb or Joshua or David or the prophets or the apostles in the New Testament, or even a deacon like Stephen. When our faith grows and we're secure in it, it gives us a boldness, a rest, an assurance. 
And so the way we approach things is different. And so after they're released and threatened some more, they go back with the church and they pray. And in Acts 29, or Acts 4.29, this is what they pray. Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. You know what they didn't pray? Lord, keep me safe. That's not a bad prayer. But that's not what they prayed. They didn't focus on their circumstance. Why? Because their rest wasn't in that circumstance. Their assurance was in something else. And so they prayed. And they sought the boldness to persevere with confidence. Why? Because Jesus is their rest. He is their only hope, their only assurance, and their life is in him. So back to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. We'll talk more about that next week. But note this, if Israel died for their rebellion against the revelation of God through Moses and they didn't reach the rest of the promised land know for certain that if you reject Jesus you will not obtain his rest would you pray with me heavenly father Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the rest, the peace, the deliverance that is in him. He and he alone is the source of our hope and our life. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here who's never turned to your son Jesus in faith and turned away from themselves, that this would be the morning that they are redeemed. And Father, for your church, whose saving faith is present and yet tempted to return to our naps, return to the well once again, Father, grow our faith, persevere us, and give us boldness to live our lives in a way that makes much of Jesus, your son. In his name we pray.